Right, this is going to be another one of my Patreon donated discussions for people who unlock the appropriate tier. Check patreon.com slash the link in the description box for more information. Now, as people might know, if they've heard, this is merely an audio one, past discussions that I've had, we always make the new people come with a topic to sort of break the ice, start the discussion going. And as far as I know, on this episode, we have two new people who've never done one before. So we've got Kyle and we've got Pacey. So I think you both said, I think, Kyle, you said you were into CSGO, not League of Legends. Is that right? That's right, yeah. Right, and then I think Pacey was the other way around. He was more League of Legends and like a, a bit of, did you say any CSGO? Uh, just the majors. Okay, just the big stuff. Okay. So obviously we will attempt to navigate the fact that not everyone's interested in the opposite topics and all the rest of that jazz, but we'll see how it works out. So Kyle, do you have something related to CSGO? Maybe is there a big topic at the moment that you want to start things off with or that you're interested in talking about? Uh, yeah. So obviously the major starts tomorrow, the PGL major. And I think, you know, this is, the first major since um, the one about six or eight months ago. And I think it's going to be pretty interesting in, in the sense that it's a, it's a very wide open major. There are a lot of teams that are going to have a shot at doing well. And obviously there's the um, asterisk with the Ukraine Russia conflict right now that, that's, I guess, the main thing that might worry some people about the uh, level of competition. But I think in the sense, um, just looking at the major on paper, this is, might be one of the most competitive majors that we've had in a long time. And, you know, it's r we're right in the middle of the tournament season, so there's no player break shenanigans. And... I think, yeah, it's just going to be interesting to see uh, which teams are came to play and, you know, who's going to do well. I actually think this might be the most wide open major in the history of CSGO because it's the only time ever there wasn't really a team. Like, realistically, you can't guarantee any team even makes the final. That's how wild it is. So at the absolute top end, there's no like clear cut contender. Like even as much as FaZe, because they won the tournament, are the favourite. Anyone could see FaZe going out in the semi-final against a bunch of different teams. It could easily happen. Then you look at the other squads, you go to beyond the favourites, you go to like the Dark Horses. You notice most of the Dark Horses, because of the last few years, don't actually have that much LAN experience. Like I'll get the best example is Ents, because yep. Ents in the world rankings have to be considered a Dark Horse. But where the fuck's the experience? It's almost non-existent in there team then you go further down further down you have a whole bunch of teams where i think what makes it mega competitive in sort of the middle of the field of the tournament is that that's where all the old great teams are that's actually where there's teams stacked with like top 10 players fucking major winners then you go to the absolute bottom and what's crazy about the bottom is you have teams that have never even played at majors players that have never played a major so i actually think the potential for upset to all levels of this major are insane and i think if you look like the it's not like the format of the majors is insanely sturdy anyway, as in it's not so great at deciding, you know, who the second, third, fourth best teams. It's kind of just decides the best, roughly. So I actually think this is the one where, like, put it this way, I, I, I don't expect many people will get the fucking diamond coin being, as if you don't know, to get the diamond coin, you have to also, like, pick the winner of the tournament correctly. So I, I think tons of people are going to fail to get that coin. It's going to be really hard. What does everyone else think? Like, does anyone else have any thoughts on the upcoming major in that regard? This is going to be a sick fire major, like, no doubt about it. You have so many underdog teams like Furia and Heroic and Nip that can actually do so much damage, like, if everything aligns for them, right? Sure. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a fun ride. Because, you know, normally place. people want to sell you that every world championship is going to be the best. In the near. Like, normally they aren't, mate. Like, I'll be real. I said it at the last one. I was even bloody on the desk and I said it. Like, the last major was, like, semi-ruined by the fact that Na'Vi was just way too good. So it made it boring as to who was going to win. And then secondly, all the teams you wanted to, like, compete with Na'Vi all had the clear flaws. G2, Vitality, fucking Gambit, Heroic. So the difference was, I actually low-key did think that last major was boring. It was boring going 
going in, it wasn't that great with how it played out. Like you had a bit of interesting things happen in the Swiss phases, but in the playoffs, for example, there wasn't that many great series, was there? Like there was what one or two really memorable ones. I mean, the jokers, half the memorable things about the major were just like, oh, Navi did make it a bit closer than it should have been. That's about it. Wasn't even that like for storylines, it was a bit whack. And then we, obviously we had the whole thing where we'd barely had any lands. We actually had just had a player break a few months earlier. I, I agree with that point as well, by the way. That's the other reason the, the major should be mega, because we've just had, like, I mean, a solid six, seven months of lands and people, like, getting their teams together again. Just had the previous major as well. People have made all the roster moves. So also, it feels like every big team is primed for this particular major. Seems like everyone's actually done a pretty good job sort of getting things so that this is when everyone should be peaking. I just hope, like, Ents really peaks at this major. So we we'll definitely make things Snappy interesting. Gets his credit, you know, like sure. it's his big shot with this team. If it doesn't work with this one, I think people will like throw away his credibility as an in-game leader again. Sure. And but, you, go on. I was going to say, I just think this might be Snappy's. This might be the best shot he has ever for making a deep run at the major because, you know, six months from now when there's the next major, and could they might not even be a top team, or these other teams might have gotten together more. So if he's going to do something, now is probably the time. It's about, the problem he has is, and this is actually like where you can sort of track into the future. His problem is basically this: if his team gets too good, then he actually won't be able to retain all the players. So in a fucked up sense, he needs them to just gradually keep getting a little bit better. Because the problem is, like, the obvious player's Spinks. Like, it doesn't look to me like he will be in this team in a year from now. Like, it, like he's just tracking too good. Like, if you're, if you're having this many stand-up performances on LAN and online and against any level of opponent, it's just almost inevitable one of the big orgs. Like, let's be real. If you go to the top with ends... That means some of the big orgs can't be at the top. So whichever one isn't there is going to go crazy for that player, whether it's a Vitality, a G2, a FaZe Clan. Like, they're all primed in theory. Anyone who speaks English can pick this player up. So that's the only issue I see for them. But I agree, this window is the one to do it at. And potentially, if there's another major, if they really do another major towards the end of the year, there's another one. I would say this year's his window. Like, if you don't do something big with it, with this squad, you will lose some of the players. And then the problem, if you're an IGL, if you notice, is they don't really seem to get recruited the same way that star players do. So it's only really, like you said, by proving something, you sort of get the call up if you're, the, if you're someone like Snappy. What about you, Zen? What do you think of this major? You've seen a lot of majors. What do you think of this one? I'm actually curious because there's a lot of teams that would say, okay, if we don't make, like, top two and four, top four, it's a disaster. Like... Let's say Vitality that spent loads of money. G2 sure. That that think, uh, you know, also have Nico and, and invested quite a bit. Um, and the, the top four according to us is Phase Navi Club Nine Hero Heroic. So there's really a lot of teams that after this will be disappointed. So I, I'm actually curious what will happen. Like, is there another major shuffle after? Because there's a lot of rebuilt squads, but if they don't have success now it'll probably be considered a failure. And yeah, it's very exciting. At least I think Phase and Navi are most likely, but it, it either could make it. And I, either would be a very nice story, I think. Yeah, I mean, on that side, that's actually where the whole VP angle is pretty cool. Because on the yeah. one hand, since they made their roster move, obviously for the previous major, like for me, if they don't do a big result at this major, I already would sort of be where I'm at with Heroic. I'd be like, I think I'm finally out on this team. You know, they had the potential, but they didn't make good on it. So either that team finally does something, or if not, obviously, I mean, people will have seen this in the news. If your Kindar is really available, he is going to be the go-to player that any of the aforementioned big teams that don't do well at the major will try and target, right? I mean, almost yeah. any team pretty much could use him. I mean, it's not even wrong what people said. In theory, you could even go to a Na'Vi if they need a player. Like, if one of their players just can't can't play in the team, doesn't want to play in the team. So, like, to me, if you're one of the giant orgs, he's the obvious person. You just you, you get into that bidding war. It's worth it. And then in terms of the team as well, that's the other thing I find interesting about this major is it will actually answer... The last major for me just asked more questions than it answered. This one actually will answer more questions, in my opinion. Like, I'll give you an example. If you think of the teams that didn't make roster moves but were right on the brink, so Heroic and Gambit are two obvious ones, imagine if neither of them do a deep finish. 
I mean, everyone's going to kind of be a bit out on those five-man lineups, right? Then all of a sudden, you're in a world where maybe those two teams have to consider changes themselves, which, you know, previously we'd, you would have said, nah, don't do it. But actually, if either of those teams don't make a big run, I wouldn't be against cha- doing the change. Like, I sort of feel like the heroic one's almost due, you, you know? Like, they've had quite a lot of time now with this lineup, boys. Like, where's, where are all the finals? Where are the fucking championships? There aren't none. I think Gambit and Heroic are kind of in the same boat. They've they've had a lot of lands at this point since, you know, the end of last year to try and get it together and um, finish well. And Gambit, you know, they, they've had some strong placings, but they haven't, they've yet to win one as well. Sure. So I feel like they're both kind of in the same boat in that sense that they, they, they're probably at the point now they, they just might need a roster change to get them over the hump to... A, might not necessarily be a roster change. Might just be a coaching change. Yeah, it could be so, anything, but... But which coach is any, uh, available again? Oh, yeah, 140 fucking coaches banned. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. <Fucking> ridiculous. <laughs> oh, the other reason as well it's worth pointing out that this major will be fire is despite the fact that I actually think the fucking... Those Swiss system RMRs and the way they did, like, how whack all the different regions were, like, the parity was ridiculous. Like, the EU RMR was basically a major, and then all the others were, like, a fucking, like, the worst DreamHack Open of all time. Like, what the fuck is the disparity there? But even with that said, we got lucky, and as far as I can tell, all the teams you would want at this tournament qualified. That's actually a miracle, guys. Every big team made it. Like, so rare that happens in the modern day, people don't know. Like, those miners back in the day used to always take at least one scalp, whether it was an NIP, Fnatic. There would always be one team would just fail. That's oh, they'd be brutal every even if, time. You know, even if that squad might be, like, the seventh best in the world or whatever the fuck, you know, it's just that you just, the pressure on you isn't immense in it. So and then you also had, random. like, the fact that you still have people who cheat in those qualifiers, and then half a day later only, then someone finds out, guess what? All those yep. teams that were eliminated... Yeah, they don't have get the chance to replay. Like, they're fucking gone. That's what kills me about the fact that that still exists. Like, the, he's talking, obviously, now about the online open qualifiers before you get to the RMRs. Because, for real, you are putting, like, world-class teams against, as you're saying, just complete nobodies and semi-pros that might just be cheating in the game. And the problem is, if people don't know the way the rules work for that, if they find out you cheated later, yeah, your team gets disqualified, but all the people you cheated against just have to take that L. Well, when that's for the World Championship, that's whack, mate. Come on. That can't exist. Like, I can't believe people defend that as well. Like, do people really not get it that if, like, the best tennis players all had to play an open qualifier, most a bunch of them wouldn't make it each time. Like, there'd definitely be at least one or two every time would just fall. It would just make the sport worse. Do we have a new topic, by the way? What about this, then? Pacey, it's your turn. Do you have a topic, mate? Yeah. If you look at the LEC mid lane class, the rookie mid lane class of 2019 spring, you see Nemesis, Imanoi, and Abadage. Only one of them got to be on a top two org from the very beginning, so they got overrated, Nemesis. But how much egg is on his face when you look at the careers two, three years later, where the other two rookies in his class have now both have domestic titles, and Nemesis is sat as a streamer on the sideline? I mean, you could make it worse than that, mate, because technically it was like partly through that split and then like the next one that obviously Larson came into LEC with Rogue as well and if you look at it like mate he had a way worse set of players around him than bloody Nemesis did in Fnatic and he's he's won way more games than him in LEC look how many fucking regular season games this guy's won he's been in the finals he always makes the semis like the joke is that guy is not he is actually like actually in theory the worst player from his draft class as it were you know Nemesis, not technically because yeah. the problem is if you want to look at like overall like their performance through all these years we're talking about I'd probably put him and Ab- Abidagi like similar level maybe slightly edgy to Nemesis you know yeah, I would say I would give it to Nemesis over Abe, but narrative wise, if you look at now, Abadaga even has a domestic title and is still I competing. I think Abadaga is actually that good. He's, he's all right. You know. he's, he's, he's all right, he's okay. but that's it. Like, he's not a superstar <laughs> wonder. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's why to me, it's actually, he is the, an example of the perfect player that should actually go to LCS. Because the point is, he can be a star in LCS, but he would just be, like we're saying, like he'd just be like, you know, the fifth best mid lane yeah. ultimate if he was in LEC, which is fine, but it just depends what, what you want as your circumstances. I will say though, like that, that, that whole draft class, as it were, shows to me 
that like a lot of these coaches and orgs that think they have a great eye test really don't. Because if people don't know, Nemesis was the first far and away number one pick of that group of players. And it was purely because his ERL team was amazing. He was oh, some, yeah. by far I, the best. Yeah, maybe it. the best ERL team ever, if people don't know. So yeah, like, yeah. that's yeah. why. So essentially, these coaches don't actually know what to look for. They just saw the best team and were like, must be him. And then, if people don't know, as far as I know, I believe fucking Humanoid was the third choice out of those three, by the way. So where these people's eye test is, I don't know. Because if people don't know, this is a detail that's interesting for people. Humanoid already had, like, won lands and stuff at the lower level. Like, he's already even someone who actually, like... Th th there was definitely something you could see there. And the reason I find it whack is because you can go back and watch those Elitist United episodes I did with Veteran. In the first split we are talking about... That was already my narrative, is I think the Humanoid guy is better than Nemesis, and if they'd have put the Humanoid guy in Fnatic, he'd probably, they'd probably be an even better team, and maybe they could beat G2. That was my take back then. So, <laughs> like, I don't even think I'm an expert, mate, in League, but one thing I will say is I, I do think I chest like, sort of follows you between games, because it's essentially, like, it's the ability to sort of see nuance or make hard decisions, you know? Yeah. The thing, thing I like more about Humanoid than Nemesis is that Humanoid built up, uh, built himself up and led a team of almost rookies to title after he built himself up. Nemesis, after being handed Fnatic, was demanding way more than he actually deserved, if you ask me. I mean, if you guys just knew behind the scenes the kinds of moves he wanted done in Fnatic, this guy, is, he's just a cunt of a human being. <laughs> like, put it this way, he's one of the people where if I asked you guys to pick your favorite Fnatic players, I could stop you two names in and he already wanted one of those kicked. So that's just who this guy is. Everyone else was to blame in the team except him. Except, I don't know, maybe he might be friends with Reckless. I don't know. Like, he's one of those people where everything's everyone else's fault, by the way. Like, he's the sort of fuck who you're, you're, he, he, you're also supposed to, like, read his mind to know what he wants as well. Like, he won't just tell you. Because so the problem the is, because problem, like... here's the problem. If he told you, then he'd actually maybe carry some responsibility if it didn't work. So by not telling you, you now must read his mind. So it's just it's just an idiot, mate. Like he's one of those people where it's funny that everyone always tries to imply that I'm the one who doesn't like address serious topics with LS. I always put LS's feet to the fire. What you'll notice is this. He just stopped ever talking about the people he knew there'd be issues with. Like, you notice he never brings up Nemesis to me. Because the point is he'd break three questions in. Because, by the way, the reality of that story is he's just friends with him. Well, he was. And that's why he thinks he's amazing. It's nothing in the game, mate. The, the, like, I think the eye test for Nemesis is fucking whack. I don't know where people are coming from that think he's, like, an elite player. He's not a bad player at all. He's an above-average LEC midler, but that's all he is. He's not a star player. And if you know his mentality, he, he, he cannot be a star because of his mentality, unfortunately. He's actually got, like, some skill, but his mentality is dog shit and his playing style is so pussy. Who the fuck would want to watch it? Who the yeah. fuck would want to watch it? Sounds like a perfect player for Fnatic. The joke is, Nemesis is <laughs> Nemesis is everything morons who don't know the game trying to tell me Froggen is. Right, any other topics? We're moving on. Something else? The death of TSM. Oh, that's perfect. It's not technically dead yet. Like, here's the problem I've got for you, spoiler <laughs> boys. In the same way as Fnatic almost did just win a split and have, like, the best paper, team on paper, I assume TSM will, in the next year or two, claw their way out of this hole. Because the problem is they have infinite money. They have too much money. You know yeah. what I mean? When you have money, and let's be real, like, just like Fnatic... To me and you, it might, they might be a joke, but to the wider esports world, they're still an enormous team. They've still got all that prestige and history and blah, 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 all the rest of it. So as much as they're certainly taking a fucking beating in the quote tweets or whatever the fucking meme is that the kids say nowadays, like they, they'll, they'll survive that. And the problem is there'll always be people who want to join top teams or whatever. So I imagine they'll just piece by... Uh, the key thing for them is they've just got to get better people that Reginald delegates to. Because... The current setup they've had at the moment, I get the vibe he just sort of short-circuited the smart moves people were trying to make, basically. The the real sad reality is what Duncan just said is right. If you just go look at Forbes, who's the highest rated dumb, like, fucking org in the world? Yeah, TSM. <laughs> yeah. And, like, not by even, like, close margins, like, by a, a hundred million more than the next teams. Like, what Oh, what's hilarious is they were valued at something like two and a half times Four, what T1 is. Yeah. Yeah, it's like mental. Like T one is the massive org. Like, come on, boys! Just well, because saw... they got a crypto sponsorship, you rate them like 
X amount more? <laughs> like what? When I, when I saw that, I was like, you know what? Maybe I'm the retard. Maybe I can't think for myself. That, that might be it. <laughs> I mean, the problem I, I is you have to realize time. you have to realize the term valuation. I don't think people understand it. It just means essentially guess what this would be worth if someone sold tomorrow. They do have a bunch of software in there. Uh, no, no, you, you're missing no, the point no, of what I'm saying. No. The, the key question is this. Is someone willing to buy it? Yeah. If they aren't, by the way, then there is no value. The value is zero. But this is a point people often miss. What then? The valuation does not mean what you or I think the company is worth. Essentially, the premise is, what would a buyer pay for this team? So they're not wrong, by the way. If someone was to buy an esports org, let's be real. The people buying aren't you and me. They're not hardcore esports fans. They would be some bigger businessman. And when they looked at what they would care about, social media following, like maybe engagement on a website, activations, hit, like how much exposure the team had. Actually, the TSM would be high on the list. This is why what people don't get is this. We are decades, I'm talking decades, maybe a hundred years before it matters how good the team is at the game affecting how successful you are. We're at the phase now where it's about how big you are. Like the premise here essentially goes like this. I'll give you an analogy for you Americans. It doesn't matter if the Yankees had the worst baseball team. They're always going to have way more interest in people wanting to buy tickets than some mid midwest team that's good at baseball it won't matter will it like the size of the org and the history of the org almost the momentum of what they built in the past will always carry them through downtime as it were down periods especially if you still have the money so the problem is even though yes obviously it's laughable the idea tsm is the best esports org it actually is one of the most valuable i mean at the end of the day, that's why they have that sponsorship you notice it's not bloody like it isn't t1 who has that sponsorship they don't have an enormous deal like that they have whatever the fuck they have with koreans and a few the Deals they got since the Comcast people bought it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the valuation is just built up in the brand that TSM owns. Uh, the yeah, fact that sure. people chant TSM when TSM's not playing is ridiculous on a business perspective. Plus, the other problem is, I don't. I'm not aware of a single one of those teams has ever actually been sold, as in like an actual Western org. Like T1 would have been the example, but that was in Korea, so I don't know the market there. That, as far as I'm aware, since they began doing these like Forbes thingamajigs, has anyone ever actually sold one of those orgs? And if so, where was the news and how much did it sell for? I've, I've never seen one be sold. I think we saw uh, Ryu uh, sell one in CS, but that was for... Way no, less. no, I mean like one of these though. I mean like but the ones like that already the had the Forbes valuation. Ones, no. no, exactly. That's what I mean. Because the problem is, until the day that happens, like these do just look like bullshit numbers, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Like, put it this way, even though in the modern day, because of valuations like this, actually some of these companies probably now do start to believe that someone might think it's worth that, and so they might start to equate with a value. Put it this way, if I went to Reginald five years ago and told him, here's 50 million for the team, probably just sell me the whole team tomorrow. It wouldn't cost me 400 million. So the question you have to ask is, what happened in five years to get them to a 400 million value? Nothing really. It's just that it's more actually what the mainstream thinks of esports. It's not really about TSM at that point in time. They're, they're just one of the boats that rises as the tide rises, as it were, you know. Uh -huh. I think the same thing happened, like, because of, like, the Activision stuff with uh, Overwatch League. Because teams just bought into the crazy idea, like, oh, yeah, we're selling our slots for 30 million. Yeah, that's it's probably a true. Fucking yes. Garbage game. Like, this game <laughs> has no fucking good optics. Like, the only good thing was that Alchemist and some actual people who knew how to choreograph it, like, knew what they were doing. And, like, that's how you got a decent amount of, like, the plays that were caught. Like, the thing is, though, that's what makes that weird, though, though jerkies. Yeah. What makes that whack, though, is this. That actually does apply to TSM in the sense that they have the LCS spot. But that's also why their valuation is actually the most whack. Because here's the difference. If you actually went to... Like, I'm trying to think if there's anyone who has some... Does anyone actually have someone in all three? Let me think. C9 has two. Oh. No, but at the moment, I don't think there's anyone. Because the thing is, I don't think... T1? I don't think Optic actually... Is Optic still connected with Outlaws, though? Or did they sell them? They sell, sold them. They sold That's them. the problem. I don't think anyone has all three of the big slots, but there's a lot I have two, obviously. Right? And in theory, remember, I keep saying here, when you actually do sell those slots, in theory, they will sell for more money, assuming the whole league doesn't crash. So the problem is, if you had even two slots, like say you had a CDL and an Overwatch League slot, right? Yes, again, to me, not worth very much, but to an idiot... I mean, those are limited. That's a limited supply of those. You, ha if you want to buy one, you must buy from someone who has one. That means you will be 
paying more than they paid. So actually, that means even just from having two slots, that alone might get you the 100 million valuation, by the way. Because each one would probably sell for 30, 40 million each. So that's without even adding all the rest of the shit you've got. What teams have you got? What contracts do you have? Any other assets? Remember, some of these teams have even built massive facilities that are tens of millions of dollars. Like a lot of the ones in LA, I know it's just re like built the whole headquarters there the last few years. So these things would all be counted in what the company would be valued at in theory, I think. True. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> just going from the Echo Fox deal, like... Um, oh. you know, 2018 or 19 can't remember i believe they sold for like 33 million totally and they were being forced to sell too and they were forced to sell like that's that's just how insane like the valuation for one team is in lcs speaking speaking of echo fox did, how much special how much blue balls does dardox career give you guys that watch league like he comes in in 2016 with like as a hot rookie, absolutely carrying a garbage TL roster, eventually gets to Echo Fox, arguably the best team for the entire split till playoffs, and then they don't get the finals because they play TL in the semifinals. That guy yeah. just ruined his reputation he, by being toxic, didn't he? Yeah, that, that's why I'm saying like his career is a it's just massive blue balls because he was so good, like just way better than any other NA jungler I'd seen in a while. And no, I, I, here's the thing. I go the other way on that, though. It would be blue balls if he'd, like, you know, only had, say, like, two chances. Or yeah. he'd he'd had, like, you know, fucking been banned by Valve, the, a riot. The problem I have with this, mate, is I don't really have any what if about Dardock. I've seen him play in a billion teams. He's had yeah. loads of chances. And he is just a dickhead. So guess what? Being a dickhead doesn't pay <laughs> off in life. Yeah, guess what? It's a team game, mate. If people don't want to be around you, they won't want to... Here's the thing. I only care about that early in people's careers because what happens is early on, often people are like, you know, they hear from some other guy, oh, he might be a bit toxic, so they don't give you a chance. People like Dardock had all the chances, mate. He really did have like nine chances in a row. And spoiler, he was a dickhead in all of them to the bitter end. To the bitter end. That's why he's a coach now because uh, no one wants him. So the problem I have with him is like, it's just justified that he'd end up like that. Here's the bigger what if. People don't even know this because they're so stupid. They don't know how to put two different facts together. So who was the mid laner of Echo Fox before that split? Do you remember, Percy? Before Dardot came in? Yeah. Froggen. It, indeed. And do you know why Froggen wasn't the mid laner of the following split? <laughs> Is it because the Dardot asked for Phoenix? Is that what he did? No, there was there was not nothing like that. It's just that oh, they okay. just waited till last minute and decided they weren't going to use Froggen, but they didn't tell him. Oh, yeah, so basically, right. that team could actually have been uh, for real. It could have been Hooney, Dardock, Froggen, and then whoever you want is the bot lane. Jesus. So that actually, by the way, could have just won LCS that split. They're close. I bet too. they would have. Yeah. With that team. I mean, like you said, they were number one with Phoenix in the regular split. They were the best team. If people don't know, that was the split where, because it was the first one where TL actually won. They actually were in like a terrible position. Were they like fifth place or something before they went in the playoffs? Like they yeah, weren't yeah, doing that well. It was scuffed. They're they're fifth, and then just double as mad carried them through that playoffs. It's another yeah. thing I hate about single limb. Here's the thing people don't think about. You know when morons go. Single a limb's fine, because if you're actually better, then you just win the tournament. Yeah, but here's the problem. What if I'm better, but I do the worst possible in the group stage, but just qualify, and then you just get punished for winning the group stage by having to play me in the first round? And then when you come, in this case, fifth to sixth, then I go, oh, you, you were just the fifth best team in LC. How does that make any sense at all? It doesn't make any sense, does it? You just punished that person capriciously because the other guy dicked around and then decided to try in the playoffs. So I hate that whole format. Because that's an example of a split where, like, on paper, if you remember, Echo Fox probably were the second best team. But yep. those fucking shitters in 100 Thieves <laughs> got to have the final spot, even though they were nowhere near the best team. They just yeah. got a fake final spot, basically, you know, because of the bracket. That was, the, that, that was my biggest issue with that playoffs, was that I, I thought 100, that 100 Thieves team got so fucking lucky with the bracket playing against Clutch. <laughs> It's because, like, the only thing that team was good at, if you remember, was, like, the fucking late game. And then the joke was, like, that was, like, the only team they would have played that just let them get to that point where they that, could win. Was that when Ryze was really broken? He could realm warp, realm warp and Zanyas? That was reused bread and butter. He would just permanently side lane. And in a team, especially clutch gaming, just couldn't do anything. <laughs> Didn't know how to do, do anything against it. 
Because I always thought that was the massive what if. And the thing about it as well is, this is where you know people don't actually give a shit about people like Rick Fox, by the way. What they care about is a TV show, imaginary version of Rick Fox, that in their real life TM is their friend that they like. And the reason you know that is, where was Rick Fox getting hit for that whole Froggen angle, by the way? It wasn't anywhere. No one gave a fuck. Even though, essentially, Froggen just played for his team for, like, what, two years or something mental, while it was utter shit. Yeah. Like, most of you guys not only couldn't even name the players on those teams, but if you did, they're not LCS players anymore. Like, they're Curious all just done. Objects. They're all nobodies. <laughs> absolute nobodies. So not only did he waste two years playing for that, but then, when finally you're going to buy the good players, it's like, oh, sorry, dude, I forgot to tell you, you're not actually required anymore. See ya. Like that, that actually could have been a really interesting era because think about the year we're talking about, season eight, that you would have had the new TL dynasty. You had TSM had Mithy and Sven, and then on Cloud Nine, they had the Sven Skaren era with still had Jensen. That would have been an amazing year if Froggen was on Echo Fox that time. That would be a fucking banger year, especially for Worlds. Think how competitive the regional would be. That would be insane. Imagine you're Froggen and you see. <laughs> You're getting replaced by Phoenix, man. Well, that's but, what happened. He just I wasn't know. told. He just woke up one day and they were like, oh, it's a new mid lane. And he was like, well, I thought, I assumed. And then they just, they just hadn't even contacted him. Yeah. Yeah, but Phoenix is just, he was a, a worse everything in front, whatever. Yeah, know. but the problem is all those fucking players from scrims are like, no, no, he's a god. It's like, yeah, whatever, mate. I've only but, watched all his games in LCS. Like, but okay. Come here, Rick Fox. Watch this as your quadra. Never repeated. <laughs> I mean, it's not like Rick Fox picked the players, but, yeah, that, but then again, I don't know you, who you did. The like, point. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, but probably some fucking slow level coaching guys probably still around now. Uh-huh. Right, what's the next topic? Someone else jump in. What about this? Uh, Matt, what about you? What, have you got a topic for us, mate? Might be FK. Anyone else? <laughs> Come on. Nobody? Really? Are you muted? Everybody yeah. dead? I'll, I'll go with something. So I don't know if this is coincidence or just I know this a couple of times, but why are all, a lot of major uh, tournaments across esports at the same time? So, I mean, the, the biggest one is like the international was always at the end of the year and then worlds also start being and then, you know, a bunch of majors land at the same time. But it's not even, okay, that's a coincidence, can happen, but then they also make the finals more or less the same weekend. It's like, what are they doing? Are they... Why are they? Is this just they think this is the biggest weekend for esports, so they all book the same weekend, or am I just remembering some coincidences that this is actually? I don't think there's any connection. So, like, basically, as far as I know, I don't think the different esports games really care what the other game does. I sort of agree with them, by the way. Like, could you imagine if it was like that's weird? Why is the World Cup having to be held on this month? Oh yeah, um, rugby wants to do their tournament. On, who gives a fuck? I'm football mate. And that's the, at the end of the day, it's the other way around. Like, rugby has to wait for me. That's, I'm football. I pick where I go. So I would have the same vibe. Like, if I was League of Legends, I don't give a fuck what you're doing in CSGO. You put your tournament over mine. More fool you. I'm getting all the viewers, man. I've got 8 million Chinese people want to watch. So you go for it. And also, I personally think an area that esports has actually inadvertently figured out is that it's not a multi-sport discipline. People care about one esport. Dude, most people don't even care about their esport. They care about one region and one or two teams within that region. Like, why are we still pretending we're in 2010 and everyone wants a variety show and it's like, well, I want to watch the StarCraft and I'm going to watch Quake and then FIFA into League of Legends and finish the night up with Counter Strike. That, that person doesn't exist or he's in this call now and it's like the 10 people who pay from our Patreon. Like, yeah. that's kind of like an outdated way of following esports, unfortunately. I know we do it because people who like my content obviously it's more about the, the narratives and watching the excellence but i don't get the vibe that's kind of how the average fan seems to consume esports so i actually think it's fine to schedule over the top of each other same as if you look i actually even think it's made like league of legends for example i think it's made the game better that they don't sort of give each other room anymore like if people don't know for real european L- lcs e- lec could probably have been way bigger way earlier but they used to purposely make it the sort of warm-up act for the fucking lcs if people don't know and that genuinely affected what days it could be on what time it could be on i think when you do it now where each region sort of acts like that's just you're just only watching your region i think it makes more sense to schedule that way personally yeah fair enough i guess it's, it's a small amount but yeah like, I know what you mean. Look, if it was me, yeah, it sucks. Like, last year when 
worlds and the majors aren't the same time. It sucks that right now MSI and the majors aren't the same time. But the problem with that is I just feel like there's so few people have that crossover, you know. Just very few people who would sacrifice sleep to watch both of them. Also, the other problem is in esports, people are just totally against watching VODs for some reason. I don't get it myself, boys. I told you, literally something like 10 years ago, I swapped from watching live games to VODs, unless it's something like I have a sponsor thing I'm getting paid for. It's way better. It really is. Like, you have to realise, 99% of matches you watch don't really have an amazing plot twist that you had to keep secret. Like, it actually doesn't matter that you know this team wins Mirage 16-10. If it's a really great game, you'll still enjoy it. You still get to... In fact, it's even interesting, because then you'll be watching it like, oh, that's weird. They win 16-10, but they're down, like, fucking 8 to 12 of them, uh, 8 to 10 of them. How do they possibly get a 16 from here? They're on a force. Actually makes it interesting in some ways. You just have to reset the filters. Because the problem is, if you don't get so you can enjoy VODs, you'll never get the full experience of esports. Because you can never watch everything live. Like, they'll never be... They'll never be comfortable enough that you can watch it live. Because at the end of the day, you're thinking of a sport just from your country only. Like, if you're watching the European Premier, uh, English Premier League, you live in England, so it's all on at a convenient time. It's not on every day. It's not on at fucking 2 p.m. when you're doing your work on a Thursday. So, like, the, the other sports are intended for your leisure. In esports, you have to sort of do a bit of work to keep up with what's going on. So, I, I'd, I'd just say get into the... Get into the habit of watching VODs. Also, by the way, another mega advantage of VODs is because you can already know which games are good and bad. You don't have to waste your time watching a shit game when nothing happens. You can skip to the next map where it's amazing, you know? Especially if you watch something like League, by the way. You don't have to watch the 55-minute game with eight kills where one shit team fight throws the whole... You could just skip that game or, or scroll through to the team fight, indeed. You just do that as well. It's about 100 times better than watching live. Yeah, I watched the VOD of TL first IG at MSI because it was at a mad unreasonable time. I had class the next day. So I get out of class. I see, what? TLB? I bet it made it way more exciting when you knew they won, right? I mean, yeah, like, how yeah. are they possibly like, well, going to win these games? Yeah. I started walking a little faster to get home. I was like, wow, this I got to see this. <laughs> It's also why I just, it's why I think I just consume things differently than other people. I'll give you another example. You know, when people are sat around and they're like, nah. It's nothing to do now because there's no league for the next few weeks. It's like, bro, you haven't even watched all the best series from Worlds. What are you talking about? Like, go pick a year you haven't watched from Worlds. Find out what the best series was and go watch it. It's probably mega. You'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it way more than watching, like, you know, some fucking EU Masters match now. Like, these are the best teams of all time playing. Like, go back and watch some fucking old school classic game between, like, fucking... Rock Gambit and Gaming and yeah. Moscow Fight and not Moscow Fight, uh, KT Bullets or whatever. There'll be some banger game out there you haven't seen that had some super duper thrills and spills, all that shit. Uh, anyway. Right, what's the next topic? Come on, someone push it on. I can go. Right. No one else has one. Oh. I have. Uh, well, with EG being so bad in CS:GO, after the major, does it any shuffle happen? And do any of EG drop the players, or does do we get on a team actually? Or what um, happens to EG? I do suspect there should be some kind of an NA shuffle in as much as I don't really see how Team Liquid and DG can both continue and they both seem to be in a similarly bad spot. The problem is this. Realistically, I don't even know if they can shuffle players between those two teams. So it would more be about who else they get as the players. That's why the really weird angle is this. If anyone saw, you'll only have seen it in interviews, unfortunately. No one made like a big piece about it. Basically, in a whole bunch of interviews, it turns out the actual players Team Liquid ended up with. It's like if anyone knows the story of Cloud9 and Henry G. Those were the worst players on his list he had to sign in the end. So people act like he th sat down and went like, right, Jack, my dream is to have a team with Woxic, uh, Mezzi, and like, that was never his fucking dream, was it? If people don't know, Henry G was trying to get Nico, Cold Zera, JKS, Jacob, like some of the best players in the world, like top, top, top players. He just couldn't get them signed. So similarly, if you go and look, apparently Liquid was involved in the bidding for loads of these players, for like Robs, for maybe even some of those players that went to bloody vitality like the apparently there was like loads of names that they were in the the hunt for they just couldn't get any of them unfortunately like everyone said no or uh, they were outbidded or people didn't want to move to na or whatever it might require you know so unfortunately 
Like, I even get the vibe. Like, I'm not as mad at Team Liquid as I am at EG. EG genuinely put together just a dog shit team. That from day one was dog shit, was never going to be good. And then now they act surprised. Well, what did you expect? How could we know? It's like, well, watch the fucking game, you outrageous cunt. Do you not see how Breeze and Soak just played for the last two years? Like, do you not have eyes in your head? What Did you imagine somehow putting automatic next to them was going to make them magically recover? Like, fucking Jesus reaching down to a leper to draw him <laughs> up again. What the fuck is this? It's outrageous, isn't it? So the difference is tl like look they've got to figure out whatever's going on business-wise and all wants to join but at least they were trying eg like people heard the stories the only difference is this wasn't it that they wanted like fucking let me think it was that they wanted valde instead of what's his name and then what was the other one that they did i think it was something like didn't they want daps or something stupid instead like those are the only like put spoiler those moves alone wouldn't have made eg really good they'd be what like slightly better that's about it so I expect there should be a roster sort of scenario, but the problem is I, I'm struggling to figure out who they're going to sign, though. I have to say, if it was me, the obvious move for EG, I think, is you get a couple of the call players, but if you know anything about the ego of NA players, I think that's quite unlikely, unfortunately, because basically, if you're an NA player, one of the ways you resolve the fact that you're not the best in the world is you go, at least I'm better than all these guys from NA. So it means you never want to let like the up and coming guy have his shag. It's like, I've got to keep him down. If I don't make sure he knows he's worth to me, then what am I good for? So whereas if you look in the other regions, if you're in another fucking region, you just pick up the young star player and just make him in your team. So your team becomes amazing, don't you? Like, what's the point in having an ego? Don't you want to win the tournament? So the problem is like, can anyone even think of anyone? Like who... Who would even be on the table? Who who can these teams get? Who would you want them to get? Does anyone have a, some some names they want to throw out there? I think that EG should definitely be looking at JKS. Um, that would just be an instant upgrade to, I guess, Breeze or Rush, whoever you end up not keeping. In terms of the complexity players, I, I think it, it's going to be hard to get those players to EG because... I think the complexity players know and the org knows that their team is just better than EG. So it wouldn't really benefit them to, you know, make a That only works that for way. the org, by the way. Like, players yeah. don't work that way, I'm afraid. I'm not, you're right. They are better. But the problem is players are just little bitches. Like, those players... Here's the joke. If I told those players it's impossible you can go to EG, now, what do you think of them? They'd say what you say. Like, oh, we're obviously way better. But the problem is if I said to them, right, that's cool. By the way, I lied. One of you, um, you can decide who. One of you can join EG tomorrow for the same... Like, they'd all fucking snap your arm off trying to do it, mate. They'd all turn on each other. Fucking, like, like the Dark Knight. Like, we're holding tryouts. Like, be like that. I agree with what you're saying. It's just like complexity. They definitely didn't break the bank on this team. So I feel like EG would really have to like overpay or not overpay, but they'd they'd really have to meet the buyout in this sense. And I I just don't know if any of the EG guys rate the complexity players high enough to really improve their team at this point. Um, But complexity, I I think they have a, a good amount of potential at this point. I know some people have kind of written them off. They're not written them off, but they, they think the roster might have peaked at this point. And I, I think JT is doing a really good job as IGLing. I've watched a lot of their games, and their T sides are almost always really strong. Like they're getting six, seven rounds no matter what on T sides. And it really just feels like um like they just need Junior to come online more with the op for their for their CT sides to just be more I mean that's what impressive. Happens, yeah. yeah, that 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 is the problem. I, I think like this, as a, mate, this guy hit the most obvious ceiling I've seen of a player in years. He just never got past it. Yeah, EG and Complexity both have this problem where their their opera is just not tier one level. And even Complexity before they had OC on the team, like I'm sure they didn't want to make the downgrade for OC to Junior when OC got picked up by Liquid. So I really don't know what either of them do in the, in terms of getting an opera. That's why the problem they're going to have is it's the same problem that's always existed in Counter-Strike and spoiler because of all the bullshit reason we had to go online in the last few years. It's gotten worse now, which is European players do not want to leave home and go and live in America. That is just a fact. There are very few would be open to doing it. So the problem with these teams is like it wouldn't be an issue because in theory you could just move your NA team to Europe, right? But oh, are you ready for the punchline? Big name NA players don't want to leave and it's great. So there we go. That's that ruined. That's why we can't have nice things, boys. 
It's they also, by the way, why I, it, actually makes, it actually makes me sick that people were such cunts towards Simple, but none of them will go to Europe and live there the whole time. By the way, it's not even as bad for them as it was for Simple. The analogy here would be, imagine if you could speak fucking Russian at the level of a four-year-old child, and I said, not only leave America and your friends and family, but go and live in Russia and just speak a second language. And when people misunderstand you, it's your fault. You're antisocial. You're a bad person. Fuck you. That's what basically NA did to Simple. So I think it's rich as fuck years later. Same players. Oh, do anything to win. All right, all you have to do is uh, move here and play with better players. Oh, when I said anything, um, I don't want to leave all my comfortable life where I live at home, though. It's like, brilliant. Great sound. So you don't want to win then. You just want to do whatever the fuck this LARP of pretending to be a pro is. Great. Well, enjoy mom's cocking. They really have it like that. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah, if I have to leave my home for it, I don't feel comfortable anymore. Like, this is up. the. How many times do you travel? Like, you're more on the fucking road than you are at home. That's what a pro is being all about. Like, live with it, deal with it. <laughs> That's what. That, that was actually one of my topics was that a bunch of, especially NA esports players, have never left their bubble of safety or co being comfortable. And the best way to fix that, from my personal experience, is you have to put yourself through trials or periods of hardship and of being uncomfortable and doing things you don't want to do. But esports players will never, especially in it, will never ever leave their bubble. Thorin, if you had to manage a team and force them out of their comfort zone, how would you do that if you could? I mean, the first thing is you couldn't just do it with any set of players because I think they're just too culturally deep on that shit at the moment. So you'd, you'd have to purposely pick players who you could work with in that regard. But the problem is, I actually think from day one, you have to be essentially teaching people how to do like stress exercises, how to put in difficult situations. Like put it this way, think of this. When was there ever in the entire history of humanity an amazing army where the way they trained their soldiers was everyone was just really awesome to each other. They never insulted each other. They were always complimentary and they just really encouraged each other. Let me know which army that was. was which was it? Mongols? <laughs> fucking Soviets? Like, which one was it? Boys? I mean, let's go through all the greats. Fucking Alexander the Great. Not, not his. Romans. What do you mean? Fucking the, the, Egypt. None. The spoiler, there's none. Every, every one of these countries. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice every one of these cultures that was great it, it's the opposite they have a martial culture where it's the opposite they're strict as fuck and spoiler this is the part nobody wants to hear in esports do you want to know what happens when you have a culture that's super strict on its warriors you just make great warriors but that's not it not everyone gets made in a great do you know what happens to the people who don't get made in a break they die. they're just broken get yeah out. you break them and when they don't work you discard them now you'll notice what i've just said there that's why i said no one wants to hear it the problem is that will be the byproduct of what you do. Spoiler, that's what the Korean and Chinese systems are doing as you as we yeah. speak and always have been. They, they have are people who can make it through the insane sort of selection gate of what they want. They become the greatest players ever. The ones who don't absolutely tank their whole social life. They become bums, nobodies. They probably work in a fucking retail store. Like just the guy that, oh, do you want something? You want some cigarettes with that? They're, they're that guy behind the counter. And probably mentally they're broken by all the burnout, the stress, the fucking expectations, the fact he came second at a world championship, not first, so you failed your whole country and your people. Like, I don't think people in the West even know what they're doing, mate. They're not even playing the same game. The joke is the guy from Korea is almost like some fucking Spartan warrior from 2,000 years ago. And then the guy from fucking... NA is like some cunt out of fucking Wally who's just like, oh, what, when's my next Sean? <laughs> like, when's, the, when's your Brits get here? It's like, how's that guy supposed to compete? They're barely even the same fucking like type of animal, are they, at that point in time? They're almost like, it's almost like one's a mouse and one's a fucking tiger. It's like, yeah, I'll take the tiger to win this one. Because that's the reason why you'll notice the real problem with this whole discussion about NA. It's not about NA. Like, there's plenty of things that are good about America. It's the problem is... Whenever you have comfort and you have luxury, you can also delude yourself. The problem with the game is the game doesn't know about status. The game doesn't know America is supposed to be a great country. The game doesn't know that it's nasty to ask people to play 15 hours a game. The game doesn't know that you mentally break if you just play too much and never give yourself a break. All the game knows is if you press the right buttons in the right order, it gives you the outcome. So here's the real problem. This is a problem that's way bigger than esports. It's that... 
not just America, just I'd say generally a lot of Western countries, people would rather live in the delusion of what they wish was the way the world operated than face the reality of how it actually operates. But the problem here is it's a business where it's a it's an outcome business. You can't get the outcome without the inputs. Like that's just the way the, that's the way any system works. I don't even think that well most I don't even think most NA people or NA players realize by the way i only use yeah. na obviously as like the example for this example. like pretty well like uk would be exactly yeah. the same germany would be largely similar like, long- like like the other joke as well as this i'll tell you one thing i'm actually sick of mate which is when people bash on na loads of europeans do it where it's like you are aware beyond about like 20 people in europe europe's just like an na with slightly more resources in terms of like players like once you take out geniuses like the g2 of 2019 like it, eu's not winning worlds mate i don't know why we're pretending they are you know true it's just uh i don't even think western players realize that gap because they never leave or experience any any of the world oh by the way it takes a long know. time to figure these things out like i didn't figure out yeah. day one you know it took me years and years it's why there's a great saying i would assume it, if i had to guess it's probably either like shakespeare or poetry or something there's a great saying in england that people use where they say what do they of england know those who only england know because the premise is to even know more about your own country you have to leave because you have to go somewhere else where they don't have the same assumptions, they don't have the same history, they don't have the same tradition, they don't have the same social rules or unspoken sort of like etiquette that you have. As soon as you do that, what you actually realise when you go to the foreign area is, oh shit, that's how things worked for hours. I didn't even realise that was a thing. Like, I, like I'll give you an example. If you are from the UK, it's a bit like, for an American, the analogy would be it's a bit like Canada. It is assumed by default, if something socially awkward happens, both people apologize. It's a way of quickly breaking the ice and be like, right, there's no problem. You can continue on. But if you go to another country, you're from the UK and the other person's from like, like I'm out in the Netherlands, for example. If you're in the Netherlands, if someone like accidentally like let a dog go on you, they would just look at you like, why did you let that dog? They wouldn't go like, sorry. It's just not part of their culture to say sorry like that. So... They, these are things like that I don't think people realize every culture has loads of programming in it that you don't think is programming you just think it's the way things are done but it's actually already done in your part of the world that way you know so the problem we're getting to here is this just applies to all these areas as well it's why it's actually low key a problem that there's not enough physicality in esports because the joke is Americans are brilliant at sports that are all about physicality because they just have so many people and so many countries migrating people there that you just you're just basically skimming the top athletes off the top. That doesn't really seem to work in esports, so you notice. What do you mean, Duncan? The nightclub events? <laughs> what do you mean? The after parties. <laughs> oh, right. I see what you mean. Right. I, I, oh, I agree completely. I was j- just like that before 2020. Like 2021, I sp- spent the whole year outside of the US, and that that changed my whole perf- perspective on everything about life, which is what <sighs> I, I wish there was a way that most people could realize and go out and experience hardship, but no one will. <laughs> I think in terms of CS also, uh, with what we're just discussing, Twists is the only NA player to make the, make the uh, transition to Europe as opposed to Europe going to uh, America. And he's the only one that's found success of like the top NA players, like the past several years at all. So greatness so, requires sacrifice. Yeah. I mean, if any of the other really good NA players like Elise or Stewie, I mean, they could have, I'm sure, joined. They've had offers to join EU teams, but they're just not willing to do it. So the success is not coming to them in the same way. One of them that Loki does tell me, by the way, is, you know, when I was saying earlier, some of the players that could have been on Cloud9, but they said no, right? Because at the time, if you remember, you remember, you have to go back in your brain two years. Because at the time, this was just before the 100 Thieves team broke up. Sadly, like those players just like, because remember, they knew the, oh, I think they just broke up and the extreme thing was just about to happen. Sadly, JKS, Jacob, those players said no. I mean, obviously they had Kassad as the coach, if you remember initially. I always thought that was the what if, because someone like Jacob is a perfect person for that team. Like small ego, but good skills would have been great with someone like Alex. Like that would have been the what if. Because unfortunately, there's another thing. Even If you notice, it, it's not just about Americans as people. It's actually about something to do with the region and about once you get to a certain amount of money and a lifestyle. Because if you notice, the same thing happens to all the great Brazilian players when they get to that status. They live in America. They've 
made all the money, they're getting paid 20k a month, they've already had their success in the tournaments, and then all of a sudden they all start to do the same thing. Their ego gets massive, they don't recruit the right up and coming players, they hold on to the legendary guy who's their friend for too many years, they just start to not care about coming first place. Like, it seems like that eventually gets to everyone, just in different levels, you know. It's a curse. Yeah, it is in a way. It's why people don't get it. Right? I remember there was a say, I think it was Jim Carrey or something who said this. He, he made some comment once in an interview where he said, I wish everyone in the world had a chance to be rich and famous just so they know it doesn't bring happiness. And what's great is every fucking comment I saw on this, I can't remember if it's a tweet or an article or Reddit or whatever, every comment was just some miserable little ghoul. Like, nah, it must be nice. If I had money, I'd be happy. It's like, you wouldn't. That's the point, you idiot. The point he's making is he wishes you could have a metric max out so you realize it only works for that metric it doesn't work for the others because it's the same thing with like money etc right every the joke is this i don't know how old school you guys are but if you were at the beginning of any esport when it was at the beginning like league csgo the joke back then is the number one complaint na players always had what in like cs for example was like oh well we aren't as good because we don't have the same salaries and the same sort of teams and then they got the salaries in the teams. And they oh, still well, didn't. well, the reason we're not that good now is because we have too much money. So, what would the incentive to play be? It's like, oh, fuck you. It's just about money with you. What is this shit? Like, you play to be great. You play to have a purpose in your life to do something, to see how good you can be. That's the number one motivator. If you're motivated, because it's like, well, I'm going to get 20k, you know, go fuck off then. Mate, there's plenty of jobs you could have had that can make 20k. I mean, I guess not fucking video game players, but there's other things you can do in life to make money, mate. There's more to it than that. Come on. About the Jim uh, Jim Carrey quote, I think he got that from like Robbie William, uh, Robin Williams, the actor. Oh, the, okay. You know? Makes sense. Similar scenario. Yeah. Sure. That man always like knew like he wasn't happy, but like even if he had money, he tried to give back to the people. You know. Sure. Thing is, to me, it's such a whack angle as well. Because to me, it's like a level one World of Warcraft player. Like, if I was at level 10, I'd complete the whole game. It's like, well, obviously, you wouldn't, you moron. It's like, look, it's like 80 levels. What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> the point is, you're at level one, though. So to you, yeah, level 10 seems amazing. You just, you don't know well, what, what struggles skills. come. <laughs> you know. What's another topic, then? Someone's got another one. Uh, the Cloud9 acquisition of Gambit. All right. What's your uh, angle? Um. Well... <laughs> Because we know, like, Russians are, like, strictly prohibited, in a sense, to, like... The sanctions and stuff? Yeah, the sanctions. How does this impact them to get to Belgium? Because I know Belgium literally refused to take any, like, citizens of, like, Russia in. The problem with that, as far as I know, I think Richard mentioned this maybe on By the Numbers... He said something like, and this would be absolutely fitting if you think about all the other public messaging around exactly that conflict. He essentially suggested that was just like a politician jumping the gun and making that statement, but that it was never actually like implemented apparently. So the reason I'm saying that's totally sort of on brand is because if people don't know, in the first week or two after that conflict began, a whole bunch of countries and politicians were like, we're going to do X. And then they never did anything close to that. They They just essentially wanted the sort of like, brief dopamine hit slash credit for saying you're going to do something without actually doing it. You know, it was more like optics. So as far as I know, I think it ended up just being like that because the reason why that was so suspicious is because it was shortly before that that we even knew that it was going to be in Antwerp. If people don't know, it was only like a few weeks before that we even knew it was going to be here. So I personally don't think they would really have banned it without knowing that. Like, wait, don't we have like an enormous sporting event that's going to be people from around the world? I I think that must have been like crossed wires. And the fact that there never seems to have been anything came from like it didn't seem like there ever was like a real proper story like the banned people i get the vibe like they never followed up on that so i don't think it's been an issue as far as i know yeah because i saw it on national television where he said it I, that was why i like thought about no it. it makes sense like i remember seeing a similar thing and I, I didn't see it through esports i just saw it through like news yeah i just saw a thing like you know because it was exactly it was almost like to the day of when it happened as well jerkies it was like there was just yeah. a thing like main guy like mayor of antwerp or whatever says no russians will be allowed in the country something yeah. like that wasn't it like it, it's some actually mad the quote. mayor of antwerp himself who said it yeah it's like exactly that. yeah and i remember thinking like, wait a minute is the fucking major there what what are we doing but sorry it's, it's all worked out i think it's all worked out. Yeah. Where is C9 going to like house these guys or like 
That's a good question. Them, or... The problem is no one still knows about any of that. Like, this is why, by the way, you've got to stop reading Reddit as a source of information, as in the comments. The comments, for real, guys, are 30 really mentally ill people just posting for 10 years about things they heard on other podcasts that they saw that they misremembered, and then fantasy parasocial conversations they had in their brain with me and Richard Lewis that they never <laughs> actually had. Like, these aren't real human beings, mate. They often could just be bots. Like, they barely passed the Turing test. Because if you ever read those comments, they'll just hear stuff like, oh, it's possible that, like, Monacy might be able to get um, a Serbian passport. So they're like, right, well, that's it. Then everyone from Russia will just get a Serbian passport. Um, it's, it's And the sol sol problem solved. It's like, there's no problem. So what are you talking about? Skips. Like, <laughs> We haven't even started to get into this problem. What are you talking about? Like, the point is, this is not exaggeration. Cloud9 doesn't even know what's going to happen with those players, guys. In fact, as far as I know, it is a gem for you because you won't have seen it in the news report. As far as I know, they even are smart and structured the deal so that they don't pay, like, all of the possible money of the deal if, in the end, these guys can't get the next visa, for example. Because if they can't get the next visa, spoiler, there is no team. That's over. They just yeah, have to go back no, to Russia. It's, yeah. it's game over. They will not be ever playing in the West again. So the problem is at the moment, nobody knows what's going to happen with that. I have a sneaking suspicion that the reason nobody knows is because right now, while the conflict's going on, it's just terrible PR to say anything that sounds like you're doing it, like you're taking it easy on the Russians, as it were. So I suspect what happens is at the moment, everyone's staying silent because they want to see how it plays out. And then let's imagine somehow it gets resolved. You can choose in what direction within the next three to six months. I suspect they will, it will be like, maybe like all Russians won't be able to get the visa. But if you're like, Obvious example would be like Alexander Ovechkin in the fucking NHL. I imagine he's going to somehow get a work visa, if I had to guess. So if he can get one, the good news is that's exactly the type of visa in America that the esports orgs have spent the last 10 years getting really good at yes. getting. So the good news is you actually probably would be able to get a visa. If you're like a cloud nine, like a legit org with the top lawyers and stuff, you could probably get those players the visa if it's possible for for like some form of Russian person to have one. So I actually, I haven't totally lost hope in that. And that's also why it's good that it's Cloud9 that got them, not just some like rinky dink org you don't know or trust. So it's not, it's not totally impossible we're out on that one. It's just that at the moment, it could still go either way and no one's really certain what's going to happen, which is, which is just in keeping with the general thing it's affected by, right? The real question is how are they going to pay them? Because as far as we know, like, wasn't all Russian bank accounts like locked out by the government and stuff? No, because here's another problem. See, this is this is actually just going to be a quick example, by the way, guys, of the way media works. Media at the moment isn't even about trying to find truth. It's about getting information to you in a certain order. Because basically, if you hear scenario A and it sounds plausible, your brain effectively goes, right, for now, I'm going to take scenario A as what is happening in the world. Now, believe it or not, even if I then present a day later scenario B, and it's actually a better argument, the problem is your brain's already set scenario A. So now I don't just present scenario B. I have to like, in presenting scenario B, I have to like deconstruct scenario A in your mind, totally prove it's all nonsense, and then you'll be open to listening properly to scenario B. Otherwise, your brain goes, uh, is that right though? I've already accepted a different paradigm. So the problem basically is this. Similar scenario happened, jerkies. All those banks and all the news stories were like, they're sanctioning everything. You're not going to be able to bloody move a ruble into Russia. It's not even true, dude. Like, if you go and look, there are still banks that are not sanctioned to yeah, this day. True. And some of the banks that did get were ones that had already been sanctioned for other reasons before this. And they just said that they were sanctioning them as a way to... So if someone didn't know that fact, it was like, oh, they are stopping them. Good, they're doing something, finally. Like, it was all optics again. So I, certainly that, again, could develop into a scenario where you can't get money in. So if that does happen, then I assume at that point in time, you just have to relocate and live in another country where they can pay, you know, maybe you have to live in Romania or something. It's even more extreme than that because the, the biggest bank in the country, Sberbank, was exempt. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. The main bank, like he, the one he's talking about stuff. is like the main bank. It's like the equivalent yeah. of like Bank of America or something, you know, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, it's it's just a joke. It's Basically, the real problem with that whole topic, I know this isn't a fucking political podcast, so I'll break it down very briefly for you. The main problem is it was all just about optics. So what they really wanted to do was this. 
like what you just said there, Jokies, they wanted it to seem to you and me like they were sanctioning someone who secretly they themselves planned on doing business with privately, but just didn't want anyone to know about. Like that, that's why the whole thing's just so scoffed. Corruption. Yeah, exactly. It's like with one hand, they're sort of going, now, now, that's really disgraceful. And then they're sort of like with the other hand, like just sneak the little bindle into my hand. And thank you. There's your money under the cup. And we go like, it's like trying to buy fucking cocaine. That was a parliament or something, mate. Shout out Amber Heard. <laughs> no need for cocaine we have plenty in Antwerp <laughs> that's the part people don't think about that's what people really don't think about boys think how stressful it already would be to have to sit through a whole trial where they pour over your personal details now imagine you're high on cocaine while you're doing that like I imagine that's a nightmare man. that sounds really bad yeah, I think it was <laughs> like a sort of ethanol like to produce like tears in her eyes like oh right that's your angle but I mean, let's be real. Because, in the modern day, there must be people who use tricks like that, of course. Yeah, yeah, let's be real. Like an actor, like who has tissues, like in certain movies, they would like oh, of spray, course, a, yeah. spray like certain types of like fluids on there. Yeah, to, yeah. That will actually help you tear up. No, absolutely. She even posed for, sure. for a fucking photo for fuck's sakes while she was like with the handkerchief, and I like wait for the click, and then like wipe, wipe <laughs> with a smile. <laughs> like, come on. Well, what's the next topic then? What are we doing? So we'll uh, pick one. All right. Khan's career, despite no international titles, is very impressive with six LBK titles, an MSI finals, and a world's finals, and with two world semis to boot. Would you be able to add him to the conversation for GOAT top laner in League of Legends? I think it's a fair addition. Like, here's the thing in my opinion, right? The problem is it's a bit tricky to describe this, but here's how I would say it. To be in the conversation, you don't have to be the best. You have to just essentially, you have to meet certain thresholds. So to me, every time you talk about, in this case, like the best player, the best at this position, the best in some specific context, realistically, you want to have a few names. Now, you're going to discount some of them, but some of them, like, so I'll give you an example. Everyone probably knows, I mean, now it's actually a fairly popular sentiment, but believe it or not, this was a very unpopular sentiment six or seven years ago. Everyone sort of seems to agree with me now, now that he finally doesn't play, that Bengi was pretty overrated, right? Now, the old take used to be, he's a contender for GOAT, and he is like the best jungler ever, has to be because of all the titles, right? The one area I agree in is, you have to at least mention his name in the conversation because of his accomplishments, right? But... The first thing I would do is say, if you actually look at his game, it was largely just accomplishments, so therefore he gets removed. So he's not going to be number one. But he's, So in the same sense, that's why Khan has to be in the convo. Because as you say, his actual resume is incredible. And by the way, he's done it in all different regions, different teams. Like It's actually a very impressive resume. In fact, basically, because essentially all he didn't do was win Worlds and MSI, I think he's actually pretty high on the list. Like, if you make a best top laners of all time, he's going to be at least top five. He might even be in real contention for number one. Like... I probably oh, wouldn't no. put him there myself, but... Yeah, his peer... Yeah, he has to be there. Top his five peer is uh, probably a good estimate, yeah. The first Celsius case, but he won with Longshu. He was... Going into that world, people thought he was the best top laner in the world, for sure. I mean, he's had a bunch of times where he deserved the yeah. status. Yeah. Also, people don't realize this. He was way more, like, gimmicky in those early years than he was in the latter years. Unfortunately, in the latter years, he just got, like, the same... Essentially, the baggage of his first years, people just applied the same narrative to him every time. Like, I, he wasn't even always the... Re like, I didn't even think on damn one he was, like, the reason they lost, you know. He certainly had a couple of dodgy games in the final, but, like, I thought he was generally pretty good in the tournament. Yeah, me too. You know, I think it was other people who shit the bed for me, so... And also, to me... Because he become not just like his narrative was that he was a choker. If you notice, that always brings every shitter out the woodwork where because their life sucks. It's like all they can take joy in is the fact that this guy has a problem. So like people went too hard on that narrative in the latter years, you know. I don't like essentially, he was he was like reverse Khan, uh, reverse Nagori rather. Because yeah. <clears throat> even when people weren't watching LPL, they kept telling me Nagori's the best player. I was like, I watch it. He isn't. Like, what no. are you talking about? Like, he's actually <laughs> having massive problems in his own team, you dickhead. But because the narrative had already been set two years earlier, he is the best. They just kept repeating it. So I don't think he would ever. He's probably never going to be my number one if I'm being real. But I, I do think he's actually now, ironically, an underrated player. Probably. Oh no, I would still. Yeah, also, look at the longevity, mate. Yeah. This guy put in a solid like four or five years at the top. Yeah, I Smeb would still be number my number one. I would have Connors number two though over the shy. Smeb the shy. 
Like... That's the other problem, though. A lot of people don't know this. Even the shy has narratives that get overapplied. Like, I'll give you an example. The king of weak sides. The shy, this split, was actually good, dude. He was really oh, yeah, good. I was, and he's not... I was watching. It was crazy. And by the way, he's not playing with any of the players from before. So it's not like, you know, uh, whatever, he just played less sacrifice, more sacrifice. No, he actually, like, he has, like, changed his game a bit in this new team. So he's another player where, unfortunately, the worst parts of his game can overshadow the other parts, you know. Way too many people focus on just one thing, and if they like that, they jump on that. I mean, the funny but thing is, I realize now, essentially, the narrative is, is is what I was talking about with the scenario analogy earlier. Once the narrative gets set in their brain, they can't ever adapt it, you know. It's like, if, you notice most of my fans even do the same thing. They're all like, yeah, but why would, why would you want this guy to join this other team? He'll just choke like he always did. It's like... You well, don't no, know like, that. You know, it yeah. could, could be different. Like, like that's why I almost get sad because what happens is this. It's like, it's so hard to change the initial narrative, which is terrible. That, like, for example, the initial narrative, if people don't know, was like, Elise is just the best guy in Team Liquid. He's a perfect human being, great guy, amazing teammate, and he'd never flame anyone. So then I had to be like, well, actually, you know, he sort of like has his own way where he's a bit passive aggressive and can be a bit fucked up, but in a different way. Then they were like, all oh, right, thanks, Thorin. Yeah, we've got the new narrative. He's a piece of shit. He's <laughs> the reason they choked every game. And if they don't remove him, Team Liquid will never be good. It's like, oh, holy fuck, that's not right. Like, guess what? He's the number one player. You've got to team in Team Liquid. Like, oh, give me a break. Like, this is why, what I learned basically through my own esports career is a really interesting piece of spiritual advice, which is if you ever look into a lot of traditions, right, you can't ever access all the information from day one they won't give you all the secrets right now true some of that obviously is like power games you know how else do they keep their status but another reason why this is a very valid point to, that i think it's worth thinking about is there's a great line that says like i think it, was from, it might have even been from like fucking young i think it was where it was like beware unearned wisdom and the problem is when you haven't put in any of the work to actually like earn certain information and find out why it works, that won't make sense. You're just an idiot. You're just like a kid running around with a machine gun, basically. Like you don't know how to operate. You don't know what the dangers are. Could just go terribly, right? Sure, that's a great tool. Could be used very effectively by someone else. But in your hands, you're just going to make a nightmare out of it all. So I feel like that with narratives. You give narratives to these fucking plebs. They just run around just wrecking everyone. Well, yeah, because most of the plebs don't watch the actual LPL or LCK. They just go off what experts say or what the, whatever garbage riot is telling oh yeah <laughs> for sure like especially if you look at last worlds where for i don't know why i don't know how they missed the narrative where 2021 worlds had the worst narrative ever it was like you had faker's actual protege and scout repping lpl and you had his spiritual successor and showmaker who's like ready to take the reins and become the the potential new goat of Korea. Nothing mentioned. Nothing. It was mostly about Khan's last dance, which is like cool, but and it wasn't <sighs> his last dance. <laughs> it's it's literally it is literally two a spiritual and an actual apprentice of of Faker. It's crazy. Not mentioned once. <laughs> oh, what? Speaking of that, what other narratives? It, any any League of Legends guys, what do you think were missed at Last Worlds? How many can they miss? Like, I think, like technically, like just the number, and that's about right. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> they misrepresent so much information, like from from games. It's actually incredible. The more stats they create, the more like they go off on things. Yeah, it makes them look a lot more intelligent than. Or at least to the average person than they actually are. But then again, that is also the club's fault. They don't... They, they just take everything at face value. Don't ever... Ne never question. Never question. Kind of like how the footfall measurement is done like in, in esports events. Oh, we have this many tickets each day like that we sell. We have X amount of people. Maybe that's like people buying the same ticket for the day after, right? Yeah. Well, maybe that's a different person. You can't tell. Nobody can. But we did sell those tickets, though. So every person is counted individually. Every ticket's the individual. This is how many people have come to our event. Boom. The problem I have, I've noticed, is this. 
is like to actually do my job and enjoy all aspects of it, I'd essentially have to be some sort of like fucking monk type character where I just like remove all ego and just try to like teach humanity and like heal the world or some shit. Because my problem is I just get annoyed by like how stupid the fucking random fans are. But logically, they should be stupid. Like they don't have access to the information I do. They haven't been around as many years. They're just random kids. Like, it makes sense that they don't know much. The problem is like, it doesn't stop their opinions being really annoying. <laughs> Essentially, I sort of agree with enlightenment in principle. I just haven't accessed it, so it does not me out, does it? <laughs> hmm. And also, it's not even just an esports problem. Like, it's the same in every sport, mate. Like, if you start arguing with someone like who the GOAT player of the NFL or the NBA is, the kid never just admits, like, oh, by the way, I only started watching, like, the NFL five years ago, but my opinion is it's this guy. They just argue, like, about players from 1970 and stuff as though they watched them. Like, now, nah, actually, yeah, he wasn't that great, actually, and I thought his wide... It's like, what are you talking about, kid? You never even watched him play a game. Why are you pretending? Because the problem is I get that in esports in the most mad way. I have motherfuckers telling me how good players were who played in 2005. And then you look at the person's profile, they're 17 years old now. It's like... Even something does not up here, mate. Like, something even does not up. I've been watching like from 2004 religiously. Like, don't have see, like have not seen like a lot of the demos of the players and can't actually tell how they play. Like, Dude, also I... remember, unlike sports, no one's ever gone back. Like, even people who are even pro players who are arguing, we never went back and watched their career, boys. They're just remembering shit from 12 years ago. Yeah, that's true. I only started watching League in season four. And all the stuff I hear you and other experts talk about from like season one, one through three, it's like foreign to me. I, I went back and watched some tournaments, but I can never actually like when you say how good Froggen was. I went back and watched a few games, but I actually it doesn't click with me. I just ha I just kind of have to take your word and watch what he did. It's also a whole different team. era. Yeah. It's I mean, the like, problem is League as a game never looked that crazy when you do the fucking highlight play anyway, does it? So yeah, that's the downside of the game. The real downside is like in in those early days, they didn't let you hear like conversations teammates have like the while the replay is happening, for instance. They do that now and you kind of know what is going on and how they think now because of that. But like... <laughs> In the old days, you wouldn't get that stuff. Like, you can't really tell how good or impactful a player is from certain aspects. Yeah. Kyle, do you have another topic, mate? I feel like you're um, just chilling, mate. You got something you want to yeah, talk sorry, about? Yeah, sorry, I can't. I'm not. I don't really watch League of Legends. It's hard for me to. Nah, no, just go to see us then. Topics. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone saw this one. It came out the other day. It was about EG, actually, that they're. They're trying to make like a 15 man roster. Um, and then a. <laughs> oh, them buying up those free, like, like, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it yeah, sounds you ridiculous. Can laugh at it because that's ridiculous. But they're and like I... basically trying to make an academy structure, how Navi have done it. The problem is, Navi scouted actual talents through Blade, who watched religiously like a lot of teams throughout the region and like the prior years before. These guys, they just pick free teams from like Premier or Main and then go, yep, yeah, that's going to be our academy team. Doesn't work that way, gentlemen. That's not how you scout talent. Well, what is I was going to say is like they're, they're framing it like it's going to be oh, a 15 man roster, but what they're really doing is they're just they're picking up two Premier teams and they're both essentially going to be like academy teams. Like EG will just have two academy teams and there's some, you know, pros and cons to what the discussion was around this. Like, oh, if we take two of the best premier teams and make them EG Academy, that it's not going to be good for them because then they can't play in the same tournaments because they're all under, you know, they're all. Yeah, but EG, EG doesn't care about that. The key exact, thing about exactly this move is EG, what this means if you're EG is you can just waste three months bringing one of these players into the main lineup and go, we're testing this guy out or whatever. By the way, it also might turn out one of those players might be competent. You know, there might be one player that's actually half decent. But essentially, the other thing to understand is this is what they're doing in, Le in League of Legends. So they're probably stupid enough to think, ah, oh, it probably just works in, in other games too. So. Just probably fucking well, copy and paste in the strategy, aren't they? The, the two teams is, that they're trying to get, Party Astronauts and Carpe Diem, 
these are two of the best premier teams. So there, there is a good chance that they could find two to three players that would be direct upgrades to what they have now. So, you know, it could definitely work. Problem with that to me, though, is like, yeah, but even if it worked, it's not going to be an EG team, is it? Like, if you're evil geniuses, the only point of being a Counter-Strike is to have a top 10 team in the world, right? Oh, I mean, for sure. It's just... That's what the they're paying for. So in terms problem, of NA players like, right I d- now, Like, I don't really get the analogy of like, oh, it's a, why does it have to be from NA? There's one for a start, you know? It, it, it doesn't have to be, but I guess the past few years have just, you know... Because, by the way, there's one thing I'm so done with. Can people from America stop lying and saying you just want to support NA players? You don't. You want to support NA players who are as good as or better than Europeans. Well, guess what, mate? That's like me going, all I want is a girlfriend. They're like, well, here's this girl. No, I meant like one who's like a 10 out of 10 model, suck my dick. Like, exactly. (laughs) Oh, notice how suddenly all the fucking conditions came out. Like, you all don't want to fucking support NA players. Otherwise, spoiler, you'd already be a fan of party astronauts. You aren't because they're not good. I mean, I don't blame you. You don't have to be good. Guess what? I'm not a fan of Smoothie. He's from the UK. I'm not a fan of him, mate. I don't have to be. He's a fucking a moron. I don't have to be a fan of his. It's great. I can just be a fan of Simple. It's cool. <laughs> Anytime I hear 10, 15-man roster, I'm just thinking that... <laughs> I don't know what... They can't be... They can never be honest with their true intentions. It's because the problem is... Astralis 2.0? That's, what, that's the, exactly what I was saying. The problem is, in theory... It would be a good idea, but the premise that will never make any sense is they aren't 15 equally good players. Yeah. Like, if you actually did have 15 equally good players, it would be a very interesting approach to, like, figuring out which one's the right one or who fits together well. Or, you know, I, and if some of them are good, you can even sell them on to other teams, couldn't you? Or use them as subs or have a seven-man road t- You could really do all these things. The problem is that's not what they're doing. So the real question just becomes, like I said, what ulterior motive do they have that this is the cover story to mask? And like I said... In my opinion, you get a bunch of cheap players through the door. One or two of them, if you're lucky, you can even sell one day. The other players, you just test out. You take one or two of them and put them for whoever the shittest players on this current EG are. That's a fucking Sophie's choice in itself. And then you bring those players in. That instantly buys you three to six months that they have to have time to bed in and give them a chance because they're new players. And wow, you must be really hurting his mental health by criticizing him because he's playing for one of the biggest teams in the world. Give him a break. He is just trying. Like All that shit goes on on Reddit for another six months. And then eventually you have to do a real move. Because at the end of the day, like, the real move is the whole team has to be closed down. You have to either start a new project or buy a new quad. Like, this one can't be fixed. Should have bought this is like This is like a guy where every limb has gangrene. You can't even just amputate one. The whole body has to be amputated. Like, it's just done. The, the biggest or the most successful multi-man roster I can think of. Or not, not successful, actually. No, C9 did both where they had Impact and Ray. And then they had another year where they were saying their academy team could fully swap in through LCS just so Jack could sell them for the bag. The only team in CS history that I know that actually was like somewhat capable of pulling this off. Guess what? We have to go all the way back to 2006. Holy shit. Yeah, I was six, year old, six years old then. <laughs> the thing is... How and that was a six-man roster, not a 15-man roster with like, oh, yeah, we've got Viz who's somewhat capable, and then the rest are just a bunch of shitters. Yeah. How You're corporate also works is, is like this. They, they see, oh, we have League of Legends. Okay, we have this Peter Dan, Kelsey Moser. And she's there now, but she was. Oh, this is a best practice. Let's apply this best practice to our other parts of the company. And then, yeah, they, they have like Stewie 2 is your IGL. So it, it's not, uh, they're just copying what worked in League because they're, probably two special people who actually watch a lot of uh, new talent and they were actually winning they won this season with two rookies so they think we can do this again but they that's the flaw they have though dude is like yeah, yeah. essentially where is their scout now in theory it could be malek except he's obviously going to get bonked on the fucking head right now isn't he so that won't be happening for a while but the problem they have is don't this. Don't forget the head of data science balance. I don't, know, I don't, know I don't give there, a fuck but... about that guy, man. I, I don't know why people keep wanking <laughs> off over him. What's he ever done? Have I missed something? What's he ever done except cheat? Is that it? Is it cheating? Is that it? And ask everyone to give him his demos? Okay, great. Like, I think I can cheat and ask everyone to give me demos, mate. Can I get a few hundred thousand? <laughs> and by the way, miss me anyone who does that angle. Like, you should be work for, like, uh, Errol's, but who gives a fuck? You don't even know that. You're just repeating shit. You That's like some Wikipedia trivia you're just reading out. You don't even know where they worked. So the main problem I have basically is this. 
the reason that it worked in Evil Geniuses is because they have Peter Don, who's like a mega eye test fucking guy who really can tell you, see this 16-year-old Fortnite player, yeah? He actually could be really good. Like, you could believe that guy. In CSGO, they don't have that guy. In fact, by the way, spoiler, that's the main thing that miss is missing in CSGO. There are no people like that. Like, there are, but they're already, like, you know, established coach or they're already an IGL of a team. Or they're like, already working for a different team. And also, because there aren't any of those people, they won't pick people up to do that role. Like, if you knew how many fucking teams told me no to getting people like Zeus as their GM or Kassad as their coach, it's like, that's why I just gave up, guys. I didn't give up because I can't succeed. I gave up because, like, in this scenario, it's like... I can't even get the horse to the water. I'm telling the horse, there's water in the other field. Like, follow me. And they're like, nah, just going to stay here and die. It's, it's like, like the actual people then. who have the knowledge, you don't want to hire. Good job. Congratulations. Pat your back. Like, it's because if you look at the companies, that I mean, Daps is fucking half an idiot himself, mate. Look at the fucking I mean, people like he works with. It's like they literally with. had the coach they probably should have kept, or they could have just put him onto IGL, but... Yeah, but here's the bad news. Happen, so. All those players are Daps friends, mate. He wouldn't cut those players. Yeah. yeah. That's the problem. I also just like, don't see Stuart respecting If you're going him. to be a GM, you have to be a ruthless motherfucker who says like, okay, you're not good enough. Get the fuck out Absolutely. of my team. Absolutely. Yep. But how many how many of those people do we have in esports? He just the problem is you'll, them Zeus you, and Kassad. Yeah, you'll never right. have them. You will never have them in North American esports. And here's why. Because North American esports is a bunch of 26-year-old business people in air quotes LARPing that they are executives. And what that means is they have all the downsides of corporate culture in America and they apply it to running a video game team. So as a result, they would never hire the person who's a genius with a great eye test. They'd never hire the best coach. They'd never hire the best fucking GM. They'll just hire some other bozo that's got a resume, that's got some names on the resume they appreciate, that went to a university, that has a sports science. But they'll hire some fucking idiot. They'll do what Astralis did. They'll hire some dickhead from handball. You know what I mean? And they already tried to do it in America a bunch of times, hire people from baseball and American football. Like, they're already... In, so unfortunately, like... Essentially, business people have ruined fucking esports. There aren't people who understand the actual game side, I don't think. Speaking of hiring idiots, TSM did fine. Lena sucked her way to the top, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Uh, hey, maybe, maybe TSM's getting a better direction. They did hire X Smithy as an academy coach. That's, that's a pretty banger. That's sign. a good coach. Have. No, it or isn't. Come on. Yeah. I mean, he, he should, I he should be able like... to put the eye test to, to the... No, because here's the problem. Maybe you don't know the story, Jerkies. Like, basically, it only got revealed in the last years of Team Liquid that, like, basically, Smithy is apparently the guy who would just be, like, fucking drinking and coming in hungover to, like, oh, no. scrimmed it. Yeah. What? And he's, no. like, the guy... Who, and apparently he just never played solo queue even during those years when what? he's winning LCS all the time. Basically, as far as I can tell, Smithy is just, like, some fucking, like like roving genius savant at league of legends who just need to play the game that's insane it's mad isn't it i know sounds like shocks that's, like when dude, he that's was like NA's, 2014 <laughs> that is na's best jungler <laughs> jesus christ that's actually mental yeah like that was the, just just the, the way it is though, isn't it? like the party industry like uh which teams were the the party hard ones in like 13 and 14 again oh like fanatic and stuff yeah like that's the Easy. kind of mentality that rocks up. <laughs> sure. Shit. That's pretty fucked. Like, if that's your coach now. <laughs> sure. Do we have another topic? Maybe one last topic? I'm all out. Yeah, what about Zen? Do you have something, mate? I have one. The new durability update. Basically, in League, they, well, everyone says fights are too short, people just die instantly. So they now launch this durability update where everyone gets more health and resistances. Do you think this is actually a good move or do you think people will just, you know, they say they want longer fights, but actually they just, they just stop Dude, I the fucking game. love, I love Riot Games. Have you noticed how Riot Games approach goes like this? Set your pants on fire. Your dick is now burning. So take a, a, a thing of water and throw it onto your pants. It's like, right, so next time I set my pants on fire, I wait till my dick's burning, then I throw the water. It's like, just don't set your pants on fire. Oh, shit, I could do that, yeah. Like, they always create a problem and then fix it with a shitter solution, right? So, like, the mad thing is... What they're basically doing is this, guys. You remember how for years and years you had to play a tank in the top lane, and as a result, if the AD carry didn't get to like three or four items, you didn't win late-game team fights. Well, 
they found that too boring. So what they did is put loads of move speed and dashes and damage into the game on all rolls. But guess what? Now the game ends too fast and the team fights don't last very long. And you don't get proper fights for the ADC. So we better put more like things that withstand all this damage we put into the game. Like, let's put more of that in. Can you see where this is going? The next move will be like, oh, now the team fight. To, to better put more. Oh, I can't. I can't take it. Like, if people don't know, any game that has this type of a rolling meta always has creep in certain areas. So, like, famously in like Magic: The Gathering or something, I think it's like damage creep was the problem. Yes. Like, things just got too much damage over time, and it's it, just like League. In the same way as most like season one champions just can't even be played versus like a season nine champion. In the same sense, like the really original like Pokemon and Magic the Gathering cards are absolute trash compared to like the modern amazing fucking super sick ones. So basically, unfortunately, like they seem to just take that approach where it's like they don't like address the actual initial problem. They just play whack a mole with where it pops up elsewhere in the meta, you know. So I think it sounds terrible. Like, on the one hand, I love the idea of a tank. Because you know what? Even though it sucks to be the tank, like, if you play top lane or jungle, at the same time, it does make... Like, let's be real. League of Legends needs real 5v5 front-to-back team fights. If it doesn't have it, it's not really long-term going to be as good a game, in my opinion. Like, the game can't only be normal dragon fights, split pushing, like, fucking super chaotic skirmish. It can't only be that. Or it actually does lose something as a game, I think. I think it's it's best as a game when you have the true 5v5 team fight. So what Riot Games does is instead of p taking the water and putting out their pants, adding oil instead. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they just use like jam or something, you know. <laughs> and now, now it's different. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, I stopped. Yes. I stopped playing. I I, I, did, I sold my league account. I was done <laughs> off that wild ride. I still have oh. mine, but I haven't played like since free, season three or four. The funny thing is, I've always thought it's ridiculous because even pro players do this, where people just like are just biased to whatever they're good at. So I've always thought the players I respect, so people from CSGO all know this. Like in CSGO, if people don't know, the French player NBK used to be famous for being really good with the scout, like hitting yes. jumping scout shots. But here's what's cool. He would do it and then himself even say, it, but I think this gun should be nerfed. It's yes. too strong, actually. It's He's actually broken. So what people don't know is like, I actually, I mean, I've told the story many times. The main role I play in League is support. And every time it is available, no matter what the draft is, I always pick Pike. Because in my opinion, it's not even like League. It's a totally different game when you play Pike. It's an amazing game, champion to play. So essentially, I, I myself use what is broken about League in the modern day. But I would even tell you, I hate how powerful supports are. I think it's fucking shit. I think it really is shit. Like, if you knew the ways I can ruin a game because I play support, it's mental, mate. I want it to be like it really was when I first started playing League, where you were a, you were a ward bot, but it meant that if you did your job well, you were amazing. You could win the whole game for your team. Because if you could just stay alive a few extra times, if you could like escape with a margin of health, if you could put just the right spells in the right order, and like oh, you could, it, it was actually a, it was a really rewarding role to play with or support. You could watch like the other team like do dragon and stuff. Like yeah, sir. It was a really rewarding role. Whereas now. I don't even know what the fuck that role is, mate. It's just, just something, just something in it. Just like Too a, strong. a f fourth, like, damage dealer somewhere along the line. I, I really do feel like this is where you know people haven't watched Dota 2. Because to me, in the modern day, jungler, it's like in Dota where you had the two junglers at one point in time. Like, it feels like that, mate. In fact, I almost feel like in League, it reminds me of when they did like the fucking try carry meta where you had like the oh, yes. three players. Like, it's almost like what the mid laner and the jungle and the fucking support are like anyway in League now. That's almost what the role is, you know. Meanwhile, we still talk as though it was like a pure 2v2 bot lane, don't we? Like, oh, yeah, that, no. that barely even exists, depending on the meta. 2v2 bot lane. Like, sometimes that looks uh, not even close. <laughs> Drew, like, when Forgiven tried to come back and just forced it 2v2. Just didn't work. Absolutely. The worst thing is, though, he actually yeah. did get fucked. His timing was really bad. Because think about it. If he came back any other season, oh, he been normal amazing. champions, he came back when they just brought out fucking Senna so, and Aphelios. Yeah. So nobody knew what Aphelios did. Jo Spoiler, even people like Doublelift were good with the with Aphelios first. Like, it, took, it took people ages to figure that shit out. So that also was the worst timing ever for someone to come back who had to be amazing. Otherwise, it, his whole personality didn't work. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but like you said yourself, he could have just fucking learned the champions. But once again, he didn't want to learn them. Like Kalista, like Sevier, he just doesn't want to play. It's because that was basically one of his um, idiosyncratic flaws, though, is yeah. that he did. He only wanted to win his exact way. 
So the problem, like, that's why famously he didn't want to play Siver. Because his logic was, like, yeah, I would win the game, but then I'd just be like, all these losers just playing Siver because it's strong. Like, his premise was, like, <laughs> I want I want to beat you on Siver, which might be the strongest pick, but I want to play, like, Caitlin. That might be, like, not even in the meta. And now that way, it will prove I am actually much better than you. Like, I actually think, in a way, that's cool, by the way. But yeah, the point I'll is, because you notice the premise is this, the, the premise is what is your actual goal? Now, my problem would be if he lied and said my goal is just to win, then he's full of shit. If his goal is just prove I am the best, technically he is right. He is, he is doing that. He's, like, he's, he's, he's making it harder for himself. The problem was, like, he sort of veered between the two, depending on what the day was. Like, on one day, he'd be like, well, I do just want to win. It's like, you don't know, do you? You wouldn't flame this teammate or refuse to play this champion or give up on a game because your teammate's in, in or something, you know? Yeah, that's fine when you're the best Western player. That's not fine when it's four years later and like how the yeah, you're watched and you're on the last team. Like, come on, just just play the fucking up. Yeah, but here's the thing though, mate. That happens to all the great players. I mean, you yeah. noticed Cold Zero is doing it right now, mate. Oh, yeah. In his brain, he still thinks he is like a world beater. Oh, he no. still be he really believes it's just all these other people around him aren't good enough. He doesn't get that he himself is about half the player he was, you know. So yeah. sadly, they just never get it in that regard. He also has the Stewie 2K problem where he thinks he can IGL and uh, yeah. just never works out. Is there, has there been an example of a graceful transition in, in league from a star player to when he wasn't as good as a good transition out of his career? Or have they all just... Uh, I mean, the biggest problem in league specifically is like in Counter-Strike, what you normally do if you do that is you just swap your actual role. So for example, like... In 1.6, Neo was like essentially what like Nico would be now in CSGO. But he became just like a, an IGL slash supportive element in CSGO. So the problem is essentially this will happen in the future. You know, you hear all these stories the last few years of like Faker and Nuke Duck should just role swap to support. That's why that people are actually envisioning there should be a way out like that. The problem is if you were a star player in League, you probably already play mid lane, for example. Well, it's hard to be a supportive fucking mid laner like five years later, is it? Like mid lane has to be the best in theory. It's the equivalent of like the AWPA in CSGO. So there have been examples, but it's a bit harder to find like a really good one in League. Like in League, if you haven't noticed, you only hang on if you have name value. Otherwise, even really good players get fucking brutally cut from the scene two years later, don't they? Uh -huh. You can go super far back. I think after, I don't know how star player he was when he was an AD carry, but he swapped. And I don't know how nah, he wasn't good a star player, JJ man. was, but no, yes, no, no. The, the, oh, I, I get listen. They're, they're not bad suggestions, but you actually just picked two people there who were like ten times better at support than they were at the AD role. Like, because uh, the first thing I thought about was who he. Other mid he was. He was not a star at all. He was never that yeah. good in the first no. place. That's the problem. Yeah. Uh, it has to be Chelsea in season one. It's the only example. I don't think there is an example of it, unfortunately. Like, most of the time, it's players who are bad at their main role switch to support and the other support players that have main that the entire time they've played are just so bad they look way better <laughs> this is the c9 rumor it's like sven doing support so maybe we'll see it yeah not, not impossible what's up guys it's dk welcome to thorn's youtube channel why are you even here though didn't you know ginger man bad this video was kindly supported by Ahmed Haju, Matt Pagnaccio Rakula, Kyle R, Pacey, Travis Goff, Adam Oaks, Animosity, Bot Pounder 420, Hades, Jensen Gore, Joseph Ginsburg, Kovacevic, Tobias Berlusconi, Tukan, Zumba, Zyrathenia, and a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to find out who upcoming guests are going to be? Maybe even suggest them on the topic for my content. Maybe you want to appear in one of those lengthy esports discussions with me. Or ask me a question for my video AMA. Well, if these perks or indeed any of the others available intrigue you, then join the Screw Illuminati today. Put the money where your mouth is. Where? In the description box below and the Patreon link.